Attorney General announced this, the President then went and said on Twitter something really strange, which was, oh, but don't worry, if you have DACA, you don't have to worry about anything for the next six months or something. So he made it sound on Twitter like he was sympathetic to the people, the dreamers that are protected by DACA, and said repeatedly that he wants Congress to pass legislation to address this. So that's what's really interesting to me. And also the fact that it looks like maybe they could even have the votes to pass some sort of legislation um, that would enshrine DACA in law. Do yeah, you- I mean, if if that was his, his goal all along, was that he didn't want it to be just an executive order and he wanted it to be a law with legislation, and, uh, you know, this was some sort of feet to the fire to Congress to do it, well, I don't know how I feel about that as a strategy, uh, but, you know, that would paint it all in a better light, at least. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think that's what's going on. <laughs> I could be wrong. <laughs> uh, I certainly don't think that's what Jeff Sessions wants. No, Jeff Sessions has gone on record, I think, repeatedly in the past by, he's taken a very hard right, hard line stand against all immigrants, really, but especially undocumented immigrants. And so he, I definitely think, he's never intended to defend DACA in the courts. Um, and I don't think he's ever wanted to keep it on the executive branch on the books. So I definitely think Jeff Sessions is not interested in keeping DACA. But I actually don't know that the president cares that much. <laughs> I, I question whether he understands really anything about it um i mean i question that in general about everything <laughs> whether or not the president understands anything that's going on but i just feel like he doesn't care that much about it which is kind of scary honestly i can't really think of an issue that he seems to care all that much about at all can you taxes, think of anything? perhaps you think he cares about taxes I think he cares about taxes in so much as the way that it affects him personally, although we wouldn't know since we haven't seen his taxes. That's true. You know, I think if you push him on it, he'd probably say that he cares about the dreamers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then the next person who talked to him would probably point out that his his core base of voters is probably not in favor of DACA, and you know, then he'd sort of go back the other direction. It's so interesting, though, because DACA is a pretty popular program overall. I'm given to understand that polling shows that the majority of Americans like it and want to keep it um, in some form. So it's so interesting because he's he's really, and this is this is true of Trump on a lot of issues. He's trying really hard to win over his base and not not trying to do the pivot that everybody thought that he was going to make, right? Like, he's not making a lot of overtures to even moderate Republicans, let alone Democrats. Yeah, and, you know, of course, as long as the Republicans are going to remain spineless, um, (laughs) you know, it it seems like it's working to a certain extent, whether or not it's a deliberate strategy or, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's perplexing. It is, I mean, I feel like that's part and parcel of the new world that we live in. I feel like I never know what that man is thinking. I mean, I woke up a couple of days ago and he had made a deal with the Democratic leadership. I was like, what? And apparently so were the Republicans. Apparently Paul Ryan was like, what, too? So, um, I don't know. Well, then he I don't got know. good press for it, so maybe he'll keep doing it. He did, and I do think that's... I think a lot of his motivation in doing things is to be the hero or to be liked or worshipped or just have people pay attention to him. Yeah, it seems that way, but then uh, why not adopt positions that would gain you traction in the polls? Well, he tries, though, right? Like, sometimes he tries to adopt positions that are popular, but he doesn't actually say how he's going to do that, right? So in the campaign, he was like, oh, well, we're going to make sure nobody loses their health care and everybody has affordable health care. Well, that's pretty popular, except nobody knows how to do that. 
Right. <laughs> so he'll make these promises that obviously everybody wants that to happen, but that's the problem is that nobody's figured out how to make it happen. Or rather, you know, in the case of healthcare, people have figured out how to make it happen in other industrialized nations, but we don't <laughs> listen to them. Agreed. Before we get too far from uh, from DACA, I do uh, want to say on a personal note that I've known several dreamers uh, personally and that they're, you know, the best of the best that we have in this country. And, you know, I hope that, uh, you know, there, there are about 800,000 of them uh, right now. And, you know, these are people that they they were promised something, right? Mm-hmm. They were promised that they would have a status. Uh, and, and so they put themselves out there and they've identified who they are, you know, which puts them in a, a scarier position. You know, I think it's scary to be anybody and be undocumented in this country. But, you know, especially if you've identified yourself to the government and they know where to find you, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's even scarier. And a lot of them are, are really trying uh, to, to make something of themselves. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to not just sort of, you know, work entry-level positions, but, but actually try to, to improve themselves. And, you know, I, I don't at all buy the argument that they're taking jobs that Americans want. I, mm-hmm. I don't think that's how economics works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think that um, by them being able, being permitted to, uh, to get education and uh, to be able to find employment, gainful employment, and then, you know, be able to contribute to the intellectual life of the country and to the economic life of the country, you know, I think that that only improves everyone. I agree. Jobs are like boyfriends. You can't steal them. If they're not (laughs) yours, they never were to begin with. You can't steal a job doesn't make any yeah. sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, the other classic, you know, it's not pie. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It is not pie. Someone, someone taking one job does not mean that there are no jobs left for you. Yes. This is making me want pie. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one other thing uh, we sort of briefly started to talk about was poll numbers. Mm-hmm. Um you know, those of us that follow 538 obsessively have probably seen that the poll numbers have gone up slightly for Trump. What do we make of that? So there's been a lot of talk about how it's a reaction to the fact that he didn't, I guess he didn't completely screw up the response to <laughs> Harvey. Like, he didn't do much, but, like, he, he at least... stayed out of the way. <laughs> he showed up one time, and then... People were like, you didn't meet with enough survivors, so then he went back and he met with some survivors. And, like, so he did screw up, but, like, not really horribly. And so everybody's so used to him horribly screwing up that, you know, everyone was happy to, you know, oh, yeah, he's doing fine. Give him a little credit. I don't know if I buy that. I think that the less Trump is actually in the news, the better he does in polling. (laughs) I think... When Trump is in the news, people remember how much they don't like him, and they remember the things that he said and done. But when he seems pretty quiet, which he's been fairly quiet this week, he's really only, you know, come out to make that deal with the Democrats, but he didn't say that much about it. And he's been visible in hurricane relief efforts, like making, you know, speeches or whatever, but he hasn't said anything outrageous. And so I think him staying out of the news has been a little helpful to his poll numbers. I've noticed that every time Trump is quiet and doesn't do a lot of terrible things, <laughs> his poll numbers go up, and I don't think it's because people like him better. I think it's because people forget to hate him so much. Well, and, you know, it's not just Trump. That was true during the election, too. I remember mm-hmm. it was for both candidates, like, the less they were visible that week, mm-hmm. the better they did. Yep. You know, so that's why Hillary's poll numbers dropped uh, when she had, was it pneumonia? Yeah, um, I remember You know, it, it wasn't necessarily that people thought, oh, pneumonia, that's bad, or, you know, she can't be president now. It was more just she was in the news again. Mm-hmm. And so that was, uh, you know, so I think that, that that says something not just about our reaction to Trump, but maybe just how we feel about politics in general right now. Mm-hmm. 
definitely. That it's it's too much, you know. I I think everyone feels right now, at least everyone in the the circles that I'm in, that like you just can't stop thinking about Trump ever. Mm-hmm. Unless you get the uh, there's a great plug-in for Chrome that's called uh, Make America Kittens Again, <laughs> where it replaces all the pictures of Trump's face um, with kittens. So you can still read the news and be informed, but you don't have to look at his face. You get to look at kittens. Yeah, can I say how much I hate that my three-year-old can identify Donald Trump? Yeah. <laughs> I was just talking about that with Adam, um, my husband, at dinner. I was like, you know, one day Ren's going to go to school and they're going to tell him about the President of the United States being Donald Trump, and I'm going to have to explain that. Like, <laughs> you have to be like, yes, I did vote in that election. No, I did not vote for Donald Trump. Well, perhaps this is a good segue to our, our final segment today. And this, again, I think is something that will be recurring. Uh, it, you know, just sort of as part of our lives and has to be, but also is, I think, something that is important and should be talked about. Uh, and that's parenting. And how do you raise kids right now in this political climate, not just this political climate, this cultural climate, really. Uh, And so it's something I have been thinking a lot about, have been talking about with people, and uh, it's something that I'd like to come back to on this, too, and maybe get some uh, developmental psych experts in, perhaps, to, uh, to interview. I've been struggling with this question because I'm pretty new to parenting overall, Um, My son is 18 months old, so I don't, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. And it's hard because I feel like he's not in an age yet where I can explain things, but he is in an age where he's starting to imitate and notice things. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of a scary uh, situation for me in that he can listen to people talking and he can absorb the messages that culture is teaching him. But I can't yet say, you know, well, you heard what they said on the news, but this is the reason they said that. Or, you know, we don't listen to these people because, you know, they say things that are at odds with our values and we don't believe that what they say is true or whatever. He doesn't understand that. Yeah, it's tough. And so I've got sort of both ages to deal with. So my older son is almost six. He'll be six next month. Uh, and he understands everything that's going on, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, too much of what's going on. Uh, you know, and my younger son is three, and he can identify Trump in a picture, and he knows we're Democrats, but, you know, he doesn't really get everything that's going on. So, yeah, it's a it's a struggle. Um, I certainly wouldn't say I have it all figured out, even if I've been parenting mm-hmm. slightly longer than you have. You know, I think... It, We talked about politics a lot before the election, sort of during the whole campaign season. Mm -hmm. A a lot, a lot. You know, in a part of it is just my husband and I talk politics a lot. And so, you know, it just kind of came up. And part of it was we wanted the kids to know, you know, we live in a very liberal area. They weren't very likely to run into Trump supporters. But we wanted them to know that we're Democrats. We wanted them to know why we're Democrats what our core values are, uh, why we were so excited to vote for Hillary, you know, and it was, I was thrilled with the idea that the only presidents in my kid's lifetime were going to have been an African American and a woman. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That was really, really exciting to me. You know, when I was growing up, I wanted to be the first female president, but I thought at the time that I would get to be the age where I could be president, and there would have already been a female president. And, um, you know, I'm now 39, <laughs> and there hasn't been, and that's kind of upsetting. You know, so that was something I talked a lot, especially with my older son, talked to him a lot about that. And on election night, uh, you know, we put uh, Arthur to bed, Arthur's the three-year-old, um, but we let Teddy stay up so that he could be awake with us when it was announced that Hillary Clinton was the first female president. Mm. Uh, and, you know, we, we got to a certain point of the night. I was watching the New York Times dial that was showing, like, the likelihood mm-hmm. of one or the other. And it dawned on me really early that things were not going the way I wanted them to go. 
And, you know, we 